that something has been birthed in our heart that has changed our life forever. Amen. Lord, we reflect upon that first morning when those women made their way to the tomb to hear the words, Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is risen. And those words reverberated in their hearts and down throughout history to land upon our hearts to know that death indeed has been defeated. That hope is now born in the hearts of the sons and daughters of God. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this glorious hope, Lord, that we live in each and every day. Pray, Father, that this hope would work in us just as it did in those first disciples as they ran through the streets to tell the others that he is risen, Father. Lord, let us live in such vibrancy and such life. Lord, let us be affected with the eternal hope that has been born in our hearts, Father. Thank you for this. In Jesus' most precious name. Lord, we want to praise you. Lord, we want to honour you. We want to follow you. We want to live according to your words, Lord. We want to be the people you've called us to be. That the kingdom of God will grow according to your purpose, Lord. Bless us, precious Father, today. That we might be the blessing that you want us to be in this world around us. Thank you for Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. great cry, isn't it? A great cry that comes from our hearts. And I, hope, I, hope you, I hope honestly that you feel it every day. I was having a conversation with someone just before the service. We were talking about getting up in the morning. You know, and uh, it was said to me, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't feel, don't correct me, but I think this is what you said to me. I don't feel that when I get up in the morning that I don't want to be here yet anymore. You know that feeling that sometimes feel like, that didn't make any sense, did it? <laughs> it didn't make any sense at all. I know sometimes some people get up and uh, forget it. Christ is risen. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Jill. It spoke to me when you told me this morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. Look, look, happy Father's Day. I'm glad you could be here to celebrate with us. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I know I've told it before, but you know, the, the first service may be a lot, a lot greater number than you guys, but you guys are so much louder than the first service. So much louder. That's, uh, that's encouraging. Um, oh. That's right. The church dinner that we've been, we've been furiously advertising for the last month and a half. Get ready for the church dinner. Um, I still want you to get ready for the candlelit dinner. But unfortunately, we've not been able to secure the caterers for a fortnight's time. So we're having to postpone it. It's a very important part of our annual, our annual time. Because when, the, when, 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 the, you know, when both services get together, and we, we need to meet some people we probably haven't met that call this church home. Um, so it's very important, but we've postponed it. But at the same time, um, I know this is very American, right? But on that Sunday, which is Sunday, the 18th, the 19th, the 19th, thank you. We're going to have a potluck after the second service. Um, so if you can bring a little something to share and we can um, gather together and hopefully, you know, um, we'll all be able to gather together and, um, and, and have fellowship with one another. Um, it's a bit of a trial and error, I think. Um, I think what will happen is that this service will become the full service. Uh, um, we'll see how many people come back from, this, from the first service to the potluck. Right? So we'll enjoy it, won't we? Yeah. That's right. Hey, um, be praying for um, the Pittman family, for um, Daniel and, um, and uh, oh my brain, it's not working. Bronwyn. Uh, Bronwyn, please be praying for Daniel and Bronwyn. Um, they need a little bit of support from us at the moment. Um, so we are providing meals for them. Now, Bronwyn asked that we would provide meals that can be frozen. Um, and so, uh, after the service, if you can help with that and support them, um, please let me know. And what we're going to do at this stage is, um, because we're here all day Tuesday, if you can prepare meals for them. Now remember, there's Daniel and Bronwyn and the four little kids. Um, and I don't know of any dietary restrictions or requirements at the moment, so 
as I understand everything is okay as far as that side of things is concerned, I'll, I'll talk to um, talk to Dan and Ron this afternoon and make sure that's all right. But if you want to be a part of it, we'll be here on Tuesday. If you want to prepare some meals that we can freeze, bring them in and we'll store them here in the freezer um, so that um, they can defrost them and cook their meals. That, that's, what, that's what Ron's asked for. So. Um, I know we all go, oh, I want to take a fresh meal, fresh food, but at this stage, that's what she's asked for. So um, let me know afterwards if you can if you can support them. It's, a, it's the least we can do as a family, right? Okay. Um, pray for your leaf. Continue to pray for your leaf. Um, look, she's grieving. She's lost her sister, and she's got the most wonderful testimony to tell you. And um, she said to me this morning, I said, you need to share that. Yes. And uh, she said, that's why I'm here. <laughs> you know, and we remember when Yuli got up and shared with us, remember? Yeah. How, you know, she was you know, raised as a Muslim and come to Christ and that incredible story. That story is just something that, something that um, resonates in my mind. But when Yuli shared her testimony, she said, I may be the first Muslim woman that got saved in this little church, but I won't be the last. <laughs> and... Um, you wait to hear the rest of the story. Yes. But do pray for her. She's grieving her loss, but she's rejoicing in Christ. Um, happy Father's Day. I understand you are from New South Wales. Welcome. Are you going to be able to get home? <laughs> do they want to get home? Are you living here? Oh, wonderful. Oh, welcome. Oh, I just knew you were from New South Wales. Oh, you were in the skirting borders. <laughs> No, that's all good. That's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Safest corner of the planet. <laughs> well, it's Father's Day. Look, I want to say some things that we, you know, all around the Father's Day celebrating world uh, are saying. It's the same message everywhere you go today, I believe. But um, this is something I said. This I say this each year. Uh, I probably do. I think. You know, on Mother's Day, we like to um, lift our mothers up and make them feel special, don't we? Because that's what we do. You know, we tell them that they are the gift from God, and they are, and that they make our world all the more sweeter because, you know, everybody loves their mums. Isn't that right? And they should be lifted up, and they should be encouraged, especially, and have a special day. But on Father's Day, what do we do? On Father's Day, we say, Dad, you need to pick your game up, don't we? Every message, it's everywhere you go. Dad, you need to pick your game up. Dad, the reason the world is, is as bad as it is because fathers are not being the men of God that God wants them to be. You know? I'm not telling you to say that to your dad. You'll get me into trouble, there, won't you? Here's the truth. Mums do light up our world, right? Yes. And the world is sweeter because our mums are in it, and that is so very true. And it's also true. Dad's... Um, You've never done enough. You know that? We have never done enough. God has placed a mantle upon us as fathers, a mantle of leadership and headship in our homes. And um, we are the ones. It's good to be called the one, isn't it? We are the ones. And the things that God has called us to do and to, uh, in our homes, no one else can do. So it's important, I believe, that uh, we stop and we think about what those responsibilities are. Well, not only just this day, but let it be every day of our lives. Now, having said that, Father's Day for many um, is not always easy. Did anybody check out Steve's um, post yesterday? That you saw that, yes. and, and that's what he was sharing. That you know, Father's Day is not always a great day for everybody. Not everybody had a good, good experience of an earthly father. That is true. And a lot of us, not a lot of us, and a, a lot of people, I should say, um, didn't really know their dads, right? And that's half the problem, and that's really what I'm talking about today. I mean, you can live in a house with your father and not really know him. And a lot of people have that experience. But thankfully, and hopefully that is the case for most of us, or all of us here today, and that is that Father's Day is filled with, with, um, with, with good memories and encouraging memories. I hope that is true. But I would just say, in light of that, there, for a father, for a man, there are two jobs. Two of the most important, the two most important jobs that you will have in this life, and that is number one, you're a husband, number two, you're a father. Everything comes after that in life. We need to understand that. So let's read. This morning we're reading from Psalms, uh, Psalm 128. It's funny, you know, I was pulling this together last night, and I'm reading through the Psalm, and it's just sort of in the back of my mind, I just 
preached this message, you know, and went back to it, and guess what? Last year, Father's Day, same psalm. Um, different message, same psalm. So, blessed is everyone, Psalm 128, who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labour of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Pray your peace be upon Israel. Now, it's one of those, it's a psalm, there's a lot of cultural stuff, cultural significance there, but it's very applicable to us today. So we'll unpack that a little bit this morning, just a little bit. But he begins by saying, blessed are all who fear the Lord who walk in his ways. And we know, the blessed life, the, the blessed man. Can I, can I say man this morning, ladies? Most of what I apply, say today applies to all of us in this room. But the blessed man, the truly happy man, is the man who it says there who fears the Lord. It's the man who is reverently in awe of the Lord and his majesty. You know, dads, we revere God, we take God seriously, we recognise that he is holy, and he must be the centre of everything that we are. Dads, do you hear that? The Lord must be the centre of everything that we are. He is our starting point. Now, forgive me for saying that, because I know it's so basic. But it's true, isn't it? He is our starting point. That's why it says, Blessed is every man who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. We begin with God's ways, right? Don't we? You know, but that means we think and we behave biblically. The, the blessed state that is described here is the life that is, I hate this word byproduct, but it, 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 it fits. You know, the, the blessed state of life is the byproduct of a life that is lived in the will of God. We have a word for it, a word that is not very popular these days. You know what the word is? It's obedience. It's obedience, you know. Obedience, we love obedience. We as fathers like our children to obey us, don't we? In fact, we can even quote some very important verses that were given to a very important man on the side of a very important hill a long, long time ago, right? And so obedience is a part of the child's responsibility. But you know, even before that, even before that, God is calling fathers to obedience. And we've got to understand that. If we truly revere God, again, if we take Him seriously, recognising His holiness, then guess what? Obedience won't be a problem in our lives. It won't be. It will not be. In fact, if we, it will be, let me say this, sorry, it will be the very natural desire of your life to obey God. You see, obedience only becomes a struggle when a person does not take God seriously. That's why we say belief, belief determines our outcome. And when we say belief, that with the word believe, we, we believe something that means we rest everything upon that truth. So in this room, you believe, you haven't thought about this at all, but you believe that that chair that you're sitting on will hold you up, right? None of you have in any moment, until I just said that, yeah. at any moment thought, oh, will this chair support me? Of course it will. You believe it. You comfortably rest everything that you are upon it. Everything. Think about that. Everything that you are right now is resting upon the belief that that chair is going to hold you up. If you didn't believe it, you wouldn't sit upon it. It would affect the way you live your life. Same is true with our faith in God. It really is. If we believe, if we believe that God is holy, then we will likewise set our desires upon holiness like God is. The opposite is true as well. Don't believe in a holy God and your actions and desires will follow accordingly. Now, won't they? See, the psalmist is talking about a man here who was a worshipping father. He's talking about a man who is blessed because he walks with God. He's talking about a life of worship. And I love that it says, when you eat, verse 2 there, when you eat the labour of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. When you eat the labour of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. He's talking about God's provision. And sometimes we don't see it, do we? 
in our natural eye and our natural thinking. Sometimes we can't see God's blessings. Sometimes, in fact, and we're all guilty of this, of wondering whether or not God is in our circumstances at all, right? But the blessed man, the blessed person who fears God, the person, the man that is walking in God's ways, the man that trusts God, the man, that man, I should say, this man knows that God will provide. Because it says there, it will be well with him. See, you can trust God's plan, can't you, yeah. Christian? You can trust God's plan. I mean, God, here's the thing. God calls us all, I think we believe this, don't we, to the vocations of our lives. We, we think that God's in charge, don't we? Yeah. You know, he opens the doors of opportunity for us. You know, he orders our steps. The scriptures tell us that. He orders our steps. He helps us succeed. But what we need to remember, and this is so applicable to the, to the purpose of the Father, we need to remember that God's idea of prosperity and success aren't measured by the standards of this world. That's why it's been very well said. In whatever we do without God, we will either fail miserably or succeed miserably. Whatever we do without God. The truly blessed state comes from doing things with God, doing things God's way. The psalmist says here, when you obey God, he will reward your labour. Verse 2, you will be happy and all will be well with you. The idea is that you'll have security. You'll have security, you'll be satisfied, you'll have a clear conscience, you're doing things God's way. You will know that all is well between you and your God and you can trust your life to him, including all of your relationships, particularly the relationships that live under the same roof as you. So this progression taking place here in this psalm. Now notice, notice what it says next. Your wife shall be a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. I want you to think about that. I believe that every Christian wife... Now, please feel free to interrupt me and correct me if what I'm about to say you disagree with, right? I don't often say that. But please feel free. I'll finish the sentence. I believe every Christian wife wants her man to fear God and walk in his ways. And there was silence as well, Right? They want their husbands, don't you, Christian women? You want your husbands, the fathers of your children, to be spiritual leaders in your home. That's what you want, isn't it, women? You're allowed to say, yes, because they're sitting right, well, for some of us, that man is sitting right next to you. Well, I could, say that, I could have said that better in the first service. <laughs> a few gaps here right now. But that's reality. You see, there's a natural progression that's taking place right here in this psalm. So we go back to the start. Fear the Lord, right? If you fear the Lord, you will be a worshipper of Him. And if you're a worshipper of Him, you will walk in His ways. And if you walk in His ways, you will take Him seriously. And if you take Him seriously, you will trust Him to provide for you. And your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Did you hear the progression of what the psalm is unfolding and where it starts in the heart of the man? Did you hear it? Do you want to hear it again? Fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you will be a worshipper of the Lord. Worship the Lord. If you're a worshipper of the Lord, you will be walking in His ways. If you walk in His ways, you mean you'll be taking Him seriously. And if you're taking Him seriously, you will trust Him to provide for your family and your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Sadly, there are too many men that want their wives to submit to them, but they don't realise unless they are godly men, unless they fear God, unless they walk in His ways, unless they are spiritual providers for their family, unless they take God seriously, their wives will never feel safe and secure. That's true, isn't it? And there was silence. Notice, God likens her to a fruitful vine, the wife. Do you like being compared to Women, a fruitful vine? It's not a bad analogy. Like I said, there's a lot of cultural stuff here that we don't really get at first. 
The vine is a tender plant that needs to be supported. It needs to be cherished as a valuable plant. It has to have something to support it. What is that in this analogy? Of course, it's a godly man. Of course, it's a, a worshipping man. Of course, it's a man who goes after the ways of the Lord, who trusts the Lord. The psalmist is talking about the man. The imagery that's been given here is a man who's like a strong wall in a house that holds everything up. Yet at the same time, he's supportive and tender so that his wife can be that fruitful vine. It's a good analogy, isn't it? A fruitful vine. God, well, God's husbands are sensitive, loving, tender, supportive men who fear God and walk in his ways. And then it says, which brings us to Father's Day, your children will be like olive plants all around your table. Kids, you are olive plants. How do you feel about that? Do you like an olive? Do you like olives? No? <laughs> you might like what it says. You're an olive plant. Now, the idea is that you guys, you children in our homes, need to be brought up with the respect and the love that God shows. Now, here's the thing, here's the thing. The psalmist, the psalmist is talking about a man, again, who is loving and sensitive and caring to his children. So dad who loves God, if, if you owned an olive tree or an olive plant in that culture, you owned something that was incredibly valuable. You see, an olive plant or an olive tree, I should say, can provide fruit for its family, not just for one generation, but for up to 30 generations. And the psalmist is talking about a man who is loving and sensitive and caring of his children. This is the dad who loves God, the dad who, get the idea, who passes on this valuable heritage, because that's what the olive represents, this valuable heritage of God. And note, the child is described, again, as a tender olive plant. As I said, they need to be brought up. Our kids need to be brought up in the, in, in, with respect and love. The same respect and love that God shows us. And we know in other verses we are told as parents, we're not to provoke our children, right? James makes that very clear. We're not to provoke our children. We're not to exact, exasperate them. We're not to frustrate them. But rather to bring them up like, as this analogy tells us, like the tender olive plant. Love them. Show them respect. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about time. That's what we're talking about. Time. Love and respect is all about time invested to see something nurtured and something growing. You know what? The school systems have our children five days a week, six hours a day. And then after that, the world tries to get a hold of them through social media, doesn't it? Right? Here's a, statistic, here's a statistic that is frightful. Many fathers give their children less than 10 minutes of attention a week. That's horrifying, isn't it? You know, someone challenged me about that after the service, first service. And, and the challenge was based upon the fact, oh, hey, my dad's around. Yeah, he's often around. But he's often in the home. He's doing what he does. But it's time spent with, isn't it? It's time played with. It's time studied with. It's time worshipped with. It's, it's all time. It's, it's all about time. And many fathers spend less than 10 minutes a week when they're giving attention to their children. Again, that's horrifying. Average, actually, an average statistic that I saw, and this is speaking about teenagers, it says the average teenager in the Western world, right, Fathers spend, I don't know how I got their final figure, but seven and a half minutes a week with their teenage child. Seven and a half minutes. You know, first time I read that, I thought, man, that's, that's come on. Where do you get those numbers from? But you know what? My, my dad was a good man. He was a loving man. I mean, he's gone, been gone for many years now. But I've got two memories. Two memories of my dad playing with me. 
And why have I only got two memories? Why are they so vivid? Why are they so stark? Why are, you know why? Because he really did. He very rarely, rarely did. And I, and I think about these statistics. I mean, yeah, they're not far from wrong. You know? But seven and a half minutes with the, with the teenagers. And you, and you wonder why they behave the way they do. Um, that we must live a godly life. We must model before our families the love and the character and the care that God has shown unto us. See, too many fathers, this is the generation that my dad grew up in, right? Too many fathers give that responsibility to their wives. No, we are the spiritual leader of our homes. We represent God in our homes. So what is God like? Well, we say God is love, right? And it's true, God is love. But you know, the chief characteristic of God that shows up over and over and over again, we sang we about it this morning. That is that God is faithful. It's a chief characteristic of God. He's faithfulness. Think about it. He's always consistent. He's always kind. He is always present. God is always there. Fathers are to be faithful. We are to stand by our word. We are to never let go. We are to be faithful in our marriage. We are to be faithful to our children. We are to be faithful to our church. We are to be men that are growing in Christ all the time. We are to be faithful no matter what. Why? Because we are to reflect our Father in heaven to our children. See, our kids, you know this, our kids are looking for consistency, aren't they? They're looking for consistency or faithfulness. Fathers need, we need to give it to them. Fearing God. This is what the psalm tells us. Fearing God. Walking in God's ways. Providing for the family. Spiritually. Being sensitive. Being loving. Being supportive. Being faithful in all of these things. Dads, you are so, so important. You've got to realise this. No one else can do what God has called you to do for your children. No one else. Now, do I, do I start by quoting George Bernard Shaw? I didn't quote George Bernard Shaw. Did I quote Malcolm Fraser who quoted George Bernard Shaw? I didn't? Second service, sorry. Malcolm Fraser said something. He said, life, remember? Not meant to be easy. But he was quoting George Bernard Shaw. And he only quoted half of it. Because he said, life is not meant to be easy, but take courage. It can be delightful. Now, I like that so much better, don't you? Take courage. It can be delightful. And Father, who's both? It's not easy, but it is delightful. It's not easy, but it's delightful. And the psalmist is saying that because it is blessed. It's blessed. Dads, God is faithful and will strengthen you to be the Father he has called you to be. He will give you the qualities that he wants you to have. He will. He will give them to you. In fact, he already has in Christ Jesus. He already has. God wants to bless you as a Christian father. He wants you to be all that you can be so that your children can become all that he wants them to become. Every day, we have to make choices as Christian men, as Christian fathers, to choose God, to walk in His ways, to provide spiritually for our families, to be men of prayer, to be men of the Word, to be men in the Scriptures. That's nowhere more clearly said than in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me just read it to you. It says, You shall love the Lord your God. You know when He said this? The Lord said this to Moses, to guess who? The men. The men of the nation of Israel. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. And Jesus would later quote this as the greatest, first of the greatest commandments, wouldn't he? So it applies to everybody. But when it was first said, it was said to the ears and the hearts of the men, the leaders of the nation. And it makes it so applicable to us as the men, the leaders of our homes. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And these words which I command to you today shall be in your heart. And he says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. 
your life, fathers, is to be permeated by the word of God and let that permeate your life before your children. Be sensitive, be loving, be supportive, be faithful men of prayer and in the scriptures. And make sure, we need to make sure that we know what the most important thing in life is. Now this is not my words, but I read this last night. It's for regardless of how successful or unsuccessful we are at work or any of our endeavours in life, the place where you will make the greatest difference in the world where you will have the greatest impact with the longest lasting results is in the lives of your children. It's a great quote, isn't it? I'll just read it again. Regardless of how successful or unsuccessful you are at work or any other endeavour in life, the place where you will make the greatest difference in this world, where you will have the greatest impact with the longest lasting results is in the lives of your children. They need you more than you could ever know, more than they could ever know themselves. We need them to be the example to them. I know I'm repeating myself, but I get to do it today, because I'm a dad. We need to be examples to them. They need, we need to bring out, again, the best of ourselves, so that they, we can be a part of them and becoming the best that who they can be. So be good examples, so they can copy you, because they will. You know, they will. Good or bad, they will. Every single one of us, you live long enough, you will get up in the morning, you will look in the mirror, or you will do something, and you will go, oh my goodness, I am my father. Right? If you haven't done it, you're going to do it. It's a promise. And that tells me that we have a great role to play in determining who they're going to become. So we've got to become their teachers. You know, because there are things in life that they will learn only if we take the time to teach them. And remember, if we don't take the time to teach them, then the world will. And I'm here to tell you, and you know this, you don't want the world teaching your children. But we need to teach them of the wisdom, the love, the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, the statutes of God before this world poisons their heart and minds against the reality of God. If they don't learn it from you, Dad, they may never ever learn it from anyone. So again, again, the average father invests seven and a half minutes a week in their teenager's child. People wonder why the kids treat their faith as worthless. <laughs> Is it a little wonder? Is it a little wonder why why our children are abandoning their Christian values and their Christian heritage? It's a little, no wonder, isn't it all, right? The Bible says husbands. You're going to love, here's the example. You're going to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So the value that Christ placed upon the church is total, isn't it? It's, it's total. It's absolute. Such worth cannot be increased upon. You know, our eternal destiny, our salvation. God's love for us is beyond capacity to measure. We understand that, don't we? Do you all understand that? We all know that. Well, Dad, your job, your job, you are called to be the one. You are the one. You are called to be the one to model before your family the incomparable riches and grace and love of God towards your children. Here's a promise. You will fail. You will fail. But let us not fail. Because we've all failed. But let us not fail because we only spend seven and a half minutes with our children per week. Let us fail only because the days that have been allotted to you upon this earth are not time enough to even scratch the very surface of the depth of God's great love towards mankind. Fail, yes, but let us fail gloriously, right? Gloriously. So cherish, men, the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ as the most prized possession that mankind has. Cherish it, children. Yes. Let teach your children it. Be spiritual leaders within your home. Be the example. Bring the presence of the divine into the walls of your house. Ensure that it doesn't die with you. Don't let it die with you. The, 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 
the absolute apex of folly. It comes in the statement of the parent who said, well, I'll let my kids make their own decisions. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that truly amazing? You know, we want to influence them on every aspect of life. We want to influence them on their education. We want to influence them on the sport field. We want to influence them when it comes to their career choice. We want to be there to lead them and to encourage them. But when it comes to issues of the eternal soul that's going to last forever, we say, oh, you can handle it yourself. It's the apex of folly. It truly is. That is letting your faith and your heritage die with you. One generation. That's all it takes. One generation and the future generations are lost. So see why you're so important, Dad? Do you realise it? Again, it's amazing. It's so amazing when we consider God and his faithfulness to us. Let me close by repeating myself one more time. His nature is to be faithful. He's always consistent. He's always loving. He's always kind. He's always present. He's always there. That's what you reflect, Dad. Don't be an absent father. Stand by your promises. Stick with your marriage. Stick with it and be faithful to God. Be faithful to your church. Be a Christian man. Your children need to learn this from you, from us. Dad, we are the ones. We truly are the ones. The only one that can show them the faithfulness of our eternal God. But don't we live in their presence? Fear God, reverence God, walk in His ways, be sensitive, be loving, be supportive, be faithful, and know that God is faithful and He will strengthen you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we pray. Lord, we have considered things this morning that truly shape this world. It's so amazing, Lord, to stop and think that it begins, Lord, at the nuclear level between a father and his child to spread throughout this entire world. Isn't that amazing, Lord? Teach us, Father. Teach us, Father, to be the fathers you want us. To teach our children the most sublime, the most profound, the most wonderful of truths. And that is that you so love this world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever would believe of him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Father, we know you've come into this world to the Lord. But we know that you are here that all might be saved. And it starts in our homes, we know it. So help us, Lord. We all raise our hands and say, Lord, we fail. We struggle each and every day. Forgive us, Lord. Strengthen us. Speak to us. Minister to us. Encourage us. Empower us. For the sake of our children and their children to follow. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.